Uh, why don't you stand with us as we begin and worship together this morning? Uh, it is great to have you here, wherever you're coming from. Uh, I think you're in the right place this morning. I think that God has something for you here. Uh, we're gonna begin a little bit differently with a call to worship from Psalms chapter eight and nine. So if you would, uh, let's make this our call to worship as we begin together this morning. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And together, I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all your wonderful deeds. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? The Lord rules forever. He assumes his throne for the sake of justice. He will establish justice in the world rightly. He will judge all people fairly. The Lord is a safe place for the oppressed, a safe place in difficult times. Those who know your name trust you because you have not abandoned any who seek you, Lord. Sing praises to the Lord, all who live in Zion. Proclaim his mighty acts among all people. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's worship together this morning with a song we learned last week. Yeah. 
this morning of who you are as we worship you just the glimpses of who you are let's worship him and if the highest place I reach is at your feet then I've done it all if the best thing that I've seen is your glory then I've seen it all your love has changed my life forever satisfied God
Tuesday is an important day for our country. So let's remain in an attitude of worship and prayer. And as people who love this God that we've just sung about and worshiped, let's entrust it all to him. As I was thinking about uh, how I would pray this morning, uh, I was moved to text a few people in our church who I know will be more active than I will be Tuesday. I'll be voting. But I texted a voting precinct captain who's the leader in our church who will be in charge of of one voting location. I texted uh, one of the uh, leadership of our Huntersville Police Department, and I texted uh, a candidate who will be on many of our ballots uh, uh, this Tuesday. And I just said, how can I pray for you? And what they wrote back was so helpful to me, I decided to let their words be our prayer. So would you join me in prayer, please? Oh God, this Tuesday is an important day for our country. Let our response of people who love Jesus to be that of going to you in prayer. We turn to you, Lord, and ask for your hand of protection on our country, on our town, on our city. Would you let us Christians wake up on election day with a heightened sense of loving our neighbor? Would you let us reflect your love christ in all of our interactions and we pray today james 1 19 together that we of faith would be those who are quick to listen slow to speak and slow to become angry lord we have so much to be thankful for we thank you for the poll workers who will be serving us many of whom are here today we thank you for the people who will be in line ahead of us and behind us to vote We thank you for our local and national candidates for serving our country, for being public servants and taking on that calling in their life. We pray for law enforcement officers locally and in our county and around our country to exhibit wisdom and grace for dealing with potential adversity and frustrated or confused voters during the election day. We pray for the candidates to have the strength to complete the race and the grace to accept the outcome And when the results are announced, we ask for your blessing over our newly elected officials for the tasks ahead. We place our trust in you, almighty God. For those of us who are fearful about Tuesday, we ask that you be our comforter, Holy Spirit. For those who are worried, would you be our peace, Lord Jesus. And in our uncertainty, we turn to your truth and keep our eyes fixed on you. It's in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit we pray all this. And God's people together said, Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning, Lake Forest Church. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Jeff. I'm one of the pastors, and I'm here with a good friend and longtime ministry partner, Algie Grubbs. We're here at the Men's Adventure Summit, and we're having a great time, right? Yes, we are. Yes, sir. Hey, if you are newer at Lake Forest Church... We'd love for you to check out our men's ministry. We've got a great group of guys that are leading that. Hopefully you'll take the opportunity to meet them. We have occasional events happening a couple times a year, and we'll we'll be telling you more about that soon. 
Yeah. At this point, the jeans pockets are actually going to go around. Uh, those are for those of you who call Lake Forest home. This is your place where your people and you want to worship God by giving tithes and offerings, but don't already do it online. This is your opportunity to do that. It is your faithfulness and generosity that actually gives us the ability to keep reaching one more person inside and outside of our walls. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to have a great opportunity to lean into the outside our walls coming up in a couple of weeks, November 17th, instead of gathering and worshiping with teaching and singing, we're actually going to come together and serve. So we have committed to pack 130,000 meals for people suffering with food insecurity. Mm. Mm. This is an amazing opportunity for families to come together and serve. Children five and up are welcome. Um, this is the kind of thing where it's really a great chance mm. to show our kids yes. what it looks like to love other folks. If you're interested in that, you can just do the QR code on the screen or hop on our website for more details. Awesome. Hey, Jeff, we'd also like to let everyone know about an exciting, fun opportunity we've got coming up next Friday night, Saturday night. <laughs> Which one is it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Show up. <laughs> yeah. No one's Show here. Show up. Back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have an exciting opportunity next Saturday night um, to have a date night with your spouse over at Spare Time. Do a little bowling, a mm. little pizza. Child care will be provided. Holidays are busy. Um, we hope you'll take advantage of this time to really connect with your spouse before we get into the holidays. And then next, we'll be having a marriage ministry course coming out soon, and we'll tell you more about that mm -hmm. in a later date. Are, are you involved in all that stuff? Yeah. You are? Yeah. It's still going to be good. Oh, and my wife Tracy and I will be there, so I hope you'll sign up. <laughs> uh, see, there you go. That's going to be amazing. Uh, listen, if you were here last week or you caught the sermon you realize that we kind of stopped halfway through Genesis 39. Yeah. We saw Joseph being sent to jail. We don't really know what's going to happen. And that's where Pastor Mike is going to pick it up this morning. <laughs> I'm Mike. I'm lead pastor here. We don't like to wait. And that's where we are in Joseph's story in Genesis chapters 39 and 40 if you want to turn there. We don't like to wait, whether it's standing in line in hell, aka the DMV, or waiting for a response to our text with those three little dots. Uh, <clears throat> we are terrible at waiting. Uh, in fact, it's our culture who invented fast food. Um, and since that wasn't fast enough, we invented the drive through line. And since that wasn't fast enough, Chick-fil-A invented the double drive through line. Like, <laughs> I don't know how they, that's some complicated math. Children stay in school, learn math, because you might need it if you work at Chick-fil-A. Uh, and in fact, the last time I was in one of those double lines at McDonald's, I decided to roll the dice with E. coli because I had a Big Mac attack. But I was in the double line and here I was. I don't want to wait. I found myself like ordering really fast uh, because I wanted to edge my, the nose of my car in front of the car next to me ordering at the other drive through. Um, we hate to wait. In fact, I think this is fitting for Americans that we're the only nation who have named a mountain that's a national park, Mount Rushmore. <laughs> like, that's just totally up. us. But if you live long enough, you will find yourself waiting and not just for a spicy chicken sandwich, but for things that are much harder to wait for. Uh, we're in this sermon series on the life of Joseph in the, the Hebrew Scriptures, what Christians call the Old Testament of the Bible in the book of Genesis. Uh, and we've called this series, Not What I Signed Up For, because that's the story of Joseph's life over and over again, and it's very relatable to you and me. And it's about the unwanted, unwelcome seasons of life, which always include times of Waiting. 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 What do you do in the waiting? Well, this is when we learn. If our trust in God can bear the weight of our pain. This is when we learn what and who we can actually trust God. And if we trust God, and if we haven't been trusting God and trusting some vague idea of God, this is when we can learn to trust God for who he is, not who we imagined him to be. The waiting is the place where our trust is deepened. 
This is exactly what we want to talk about this morning. And sometimes our period of waiting in an unexpected season is chosen for us, foisted upon us. That's the case for Joseph. But sometimes we ourselves, when we get into an unexpected season, we are so paralyzed and uncertain that we're frozen in indecision and we prolong the waiting ourselves. Last week, we saw that Joseph was, after a bunch of bad stuff happened to him, some more bad stuff happened. He was thrown into jail unjustly, to summarize it succinctly, in Egypt, but ancient Egypt. But as in the first chapter of his unexpected season, when Joseph moved from the pit into captivity and servitude in the house of a man called Potiphar, the same thing happened. Look at Genesis 39, 21 is where we'll start. The Lord was with Joseph first, notice, in his unexpected season, not what Joseph signed up for to be in jail. In your unexpected season, in spite of our feelings, the fact is the Lord is with you as he was with Joseph. Secondly, notice it manifest, the Lord's presence with Joseph manifested itself in a unique way. The Lord showed Joseph kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. And so God has extended, he's with Joseph, and instead of being with him in a way that gets him out of jail free or gets him extra rations or a private room, uh, instead it, God with him manifests itself as being good for other people in the circumstance he doesn't want to be in. Interesting. This is God's kindness to him, is to allow him to be a blessing to others, even in his unexpected season, even in waiting. It can be a way of you and I experiencing and expressing God's kindness in our lives during the unexpected season. It's not the way we wish for him to show up, is for, oh, I'm here, I didn't want to be here, I wanted to be there. I wanted to be in this dream, not this nightmare. But could your presence and kindness to me be exhibited in blessing to others even though I'm somewhere I don't want to be? That's the case with Joseph, and it showed humility. And so it wasn't long before the prison warden gives Joseph more responsibility. He's a talented man, as you see over and over in Scripture. Verse 23 of chapter 39 says, The prison warden eventually came to pay no attention to anything under Joseph's care. So he's the head prisoner on the cell block, and things are working well under him. And time passes. Joseph's dreams are dead. He's in jail. He's doing something he doesn't want to do. He's like the head prisoner guy. Who, who went to school for that? Not Joseph, but that's the job he's in. But he kept showing up, and God kept granting him favor and blessing other people through him in this unexpected place. And Joseph now is passing the test of humility. He's faithful and serving others in the circumstance he didn't sign up for. And this is an opportunity for you and I to experience God's favor and God's kindness in the ways that we bless and serve others humbly, even though we're in a place we didn't want to be. And you could think, well, Joseph doesn't have any choice. Dude's in jail. Well, yes, he does. He could have sat there and moped and kept to himself. He could have withdrawn into himself. But he had, choice. he had choices to make. And even if you, I'll quote from the book that's our source material for this series by Nicole Eunice. Even if you're experiencing extreme limits in your unwanted seasons, you still have choices to make. You and I alone determine our attitude, our outlook, our hope. That's part of what we control in our unexpected season. Joseph had that choice, and he chose well. And now, now the next thing that happens in the story, we're not sure how long he was in jail before this, um, the, the Pharaoh has like his main cupbearer who would drink his wine or whatever he drank, you know, to make sure it wasn't poisoned, and he had a main baker who would make his food. And it came time for an annual review, and Pharaoh was displeased. And I hope this has never happened to you after a bad review at work. But uh, Pharaoh decided to throw his chief cupbearer and chief baker in jail. Um, uh, verse, uh, and Joseph was assigned to take care of them. Uh, chapter 40, verse 1. 
Then it came about after these things that the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt offended the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was furious with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. So he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard in the prison, the same place where Joseph was imprisoned. And the captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them, and Joseph took care of them. And they were in confinement for some time. There's some more waiting here. We don't know how long. And Joseph showed up for these two men under his care in a place he didn't want to be, doing a job he didn't want to do. But the Lord was with him, and his main experience of that was the Lord showing favor to other people through him. And he chose to act with that same humility toward these two people. He noticed. He cared. He didn't just do the minimum and mail it in. He engaged with these two people in his unwanted circumstance. Uh, one night, uh, these two men had strange, very detailed dreams, um, and Joseph saw them the next morning. Chapter 40, verse 6. Joseph noticed they both looked upset. He paid attention. He wasn't so caught up in his own, not what I signed up for story. God, why do you have me here? This stinks, this sucks, this everything else. I don't want to be here. He wasn't so caught up in this that he didn't uh, look past them in his own pain, overlooked the pain of others. He took note of their pain and engaged with them. And it's only that he acknowledged their pain that the beginning of his redemption story starts. We're not going to see it today, but it, it starts here. Verse 7, Joseph asked them, why do you look so sad today? This is how he engaged. And he discovered that, that they'd had this weird dream and, and they were hoping someone could interpret it. Uh, in his humility, he noticed their need, and this guided his response. Verse 8, don't interpretations belong to God? He's giving God glory. Uh, tell me your dreams. And he knew that he had this unique giftedness to interpret dreams. Humility is a mix of presence and confidence. Uh, humility is the choice to decenter your pain as the primary driver of your choices and recenter on God's purpose and God's timing and God's plans, even in the most painful of seasons, even in waiting. And this is a choice that all of us have in our seasons of waiting that we don't want. We're not in charge of the timeline. We don't know when it's going to come to an end, and Joseph didn't hear. But instead of centering it all on his own pain, he centered it on God's purposes through him to those who were with him in this unwanted situation. Are you humble enough? This is a diagnostic for you and me. Maybe you're in an unwanted season now. Maybe you can think back to them. We know we will face them in the future. A diagnostic. Am I being humble enough to notice and serve others even while I wait because of my own pain? You know, our meal packing on Sunday morning, we've never done this before. It's going to be pretty cool. We'll be here at the same times on Sunday, and we all need to sign up ahead of time so that it's not a disaster. Um, so that we can assign you to tables. But the, the, an example, if you're in a season of waiting, an unexpected season right now, showing up to pack meals for other people rather than only curling up in your own pain would be a way of allowing Joseph's humility to become your own and allow a, a way of stating with your actions, though the Lord is still with me, by being a blessing to others. And so that's part of what we'll all express in the middle of this series two Sundays from now when we pack hundred and some thousand meals. I don't know how it's possible. I can't wait to see it. Um, I don't know who's going to be counting, but that's cool. Humility makes us willing to help, but it also enables us to ask for help. Because after Joseph interpreted the dreams, for one guy, the baker, it was going to go bad. Like some bad stuff's going to happen to you, man. Sorry. Um, for the cupbearer, uh, it was that, uh, it was, hey, in three days, you're going to be reinstated to Pharaoh's court. Good news for you. And, and, and that actually, and so Joseph knows he has this ability. Those guys don't know for sure. But um, Joseph asked for their help. Look at chapter 40, verse 14. 
Hey, Joseph said, when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. You've heard of them. Well, I'm one of them. And even here, I've done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. So he asked for help. Uh, He's not just stuffing his pain. He's naming. Hey, I didn't plan on being here. I shouldn't be here. So he's naming it, even while making uh, being humble and serving others in the middle of it. And so here's where the, the, the story is supposed to turn good again, right? Joseph waited, and look, he was humble. The Lord was with him by serving and being a blessing to others. Surely, God's going to reward Joseph now and come through for him and change his circumstances. Surely, Joseph will be vindicated and elevated now, right? So on their way out of prison, so it happened three days later. The cupbearer got called up, back from the miners, <laughs> up to from the Savannah Bananas to whatever their major league team is, back to Pharaoh's court. And, and Joseph is singing, oh, one of my favorite animated movies of all time is uh, uh, Coco. And the theme song was, remember me. That's Joseph's song. Remember me when you get back to Pharaoh's court. It's all going to get better now for Joseph, right? Look at verse 23. Yet even after all that, the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot all about him. That's the end of chapter 40. Chapter 41 starts this way. When two full years had passed, dot, dot, dot. We'll get to the dot. I'll get to the dot, dot, dot next Sunday. But we're in an interlude between chapter 40 and 41. The cupbearer forgot about Joseph, even after he said, remember me, and two full years passed. Of course, Joseph doesn't know how long it's gonna be. He just knows he's still in jail and forgotten. Now what? In this bad interlude. Movies often have interludes, you know, like where a bunch of time needs to pass, and so they'll show a bunch of scenes of people riding bikes and doing happy stuff. This is an unhappy interlude. With like bad things. So just, if it was in a movie, it'd be a song in a, in a minor key. And it would just show day after day, Joseph sitting in his jail cell. <laughs> That's a long interlude. Now what? We, now we enter into trust. For Joseph, the interlude of waiting, which is part of every not what I signed up for season, happens during this bridge between chapters 40 and 41. Just when it seemed to Joseph that hope had arrived, his fortune was changing. And can you imagine the first day, Joseph's dream comes true. Three days later, the cupbearer goes back to Pharaoh's. Can you imagine Joseph woke up the fourth day after interpreting the dream, and he had a little spark of hope in his heart? Things are looking up. I I was allowed for God to be with me and to serve that man, the cupbearer. It came true. I asked him to remember me. I bet you... I bet you I'm getting pulled out of this, the clink here soon. And he had a spark of hope that slowly, slowly died out until he realized, I've been forgotten again. It, this is not what I signed up for. And this is a moment when things are stripped away from you. What you want to happen has not happened. It is not happening. And you're not in control of if and when it will happen. And it raises the issue of trust and trust in God. The idea, there's an idea that we don't want to, we don't want to believe, but we have to face it in these moments. God is delaying my vindication. God has not seen fit to restore me. God has chosen out of all the sovereign things he could be doing in the universe right now to not grant my dream for my life at this moment. Do I trust God? And this happens because this question is raised because our unexpected seasons, they almost never resolve quickly, do they? They just don't. Joseph's didn't. However... It's in the slowness 
It's in the waiting that some things happen that can't happen any other way, for whatever reason. It's like a, it's a, it's a, it's a law. There's some things where the healing, the growing, the shifting that can happen over a delayed period of time can dismantle false notions we have had of who God is and how all this works and build up a true notion and trust in the God who is. It's in the slowness that we can reconstruct our beliefs into something stronger, more resilient, more true, which is actual trust in God. And we never know how long the season will, wait, will be. Our trust, cannot come, our trust in God cannot come from knowing the timeline because we don't. That would be a false trust if it depends on the timeline. Our trust can only come from renewing our knowledge of the God who set time into motion at the beginning. Waiting. I remember waiting for my 16th birthday. It was excruciating because I was going to get my driver's license that day. I had an appointment at the DMV, speaking of, to, to take the test. And then I was going to be able to take this girl out on a car date that I really, I was pretty sure that I was going to seal the deal with her because uh, I was a dude with a car now. Um, and I waited, I waited, and on my birthday, I went for the driving test, and I failed. I didn't get my license, so I had to say, um, about that date, uh, and I had to wait a month to come back and take the test again. I hated waiting for that. Um, as much as we hate to admit it, waiting is a fierce but fruitful teacher. It's in the rocky ground in between what we hoped for and what we are actually experiencing that there's an opportunity for something entirely new to grow. There are some lessons that can only be learned in the rocky soil of waiting in a place not of our choosing. And this place is the one that teaches us what it means to trust God when I don't have immediate evidence for why I should continue to trust him in my circumstances. And the rocky place of waiting reveals what my faith is really built on. It often reveals maybe my shocking inability to apply my knowledge of God's goodness and his nature to my reality and my real story, whether I'm in the prison or the palace. Uh, this two-year interlude with Joseph in God's word forces us to engage with our doubts. Is God really in control? Is God really good? Two Sundays ago, as we engaged with a part of God's story, we really the Holy Spirit decided that was a day that he was going to engage our hearts. And many of you had your hearts very fully open with what we talked about two Sundays ago, particularly wounds from family sin patterns and how that plays out today, as we saw it exemplified in Joseph's life. That was a God speaking to our heart. Today, I want to suggest and hope that God might speak to our mind, to our head, about who God is so that we have solid doctrine and knowledge of who God is for these times when our circumstances cause us to question his goodness. In our binary belief system, where we're like, well, God's in control of everything and he's good, so only good things would happen to me. And that doesn't work out and it causes like courageous questions. Like, if God's so good, why did he allow this to happen? That's a question I've talked about a lot with many of you. In our coffee shop, in other coffee shops, and in my office. Because, and this is when we learn in these seasons of life that trust isn't something that you just set it and forget it. Trust in God. Trust is not something we learn and master one time for all in God. Trust is an active, rigorous, intentional decision to live according to something that I can't always see. It's discovering there are still good things to be found, just like Joseph did, even in those barren seasons. 
But a hard truth that I've learned in my own not what I signed up for seasons, and I see it in Joseph's, is trust can't be trust until it's been tested over time. This is true if, 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 in any relationships. If you've ever been in therapy, uh, in counseling uh, for relationship issues, you have learned, hey, trust is not something you just give away to somebody based on nothing. Trust should be earned over time. Uh, and that's true in our relationship with God. Our trust in God must be built, even tested over time. Uh, my experience with trusting God is rigorous. It's been uneven. It takes work. Every day I'm learning to trust God in new ways, even after 45 years of, of attempting to follow Jesus lovingly. And I wrestle with these questions, and, and I wrestle with them more for you than even for myself. Like, I know God is almighty and powerful in that he's holy and he's in charge and he created everything. He's the creator. Got that? That's the biggie on the eye chart for 99% of humanity in all of history, right? But when, the, when I hear you talk about the anxiety lying heavy on your chest at night, your heart's racing when you should be sleeping, when you tell me about crying in the shower, when you're desperate, <clears throat> longing for God to give you something, anything to keep you going, when all you're feeling from God is silence, it can be hard to believe and trust that God is all that God says he is, powerful and good, loving and merciful, and in control. The true task in this season of waiting is to believe that God is still trustworthy and to actually trust Him in all these ways, that He is powerful, He is in control, and He is good. These are three constants that God teaches us about God's self. And even through Joseph, he's forming a family of the children of God called the children of Israel to reveal these aspects of his character to the world, to the nations, and then ultimately through Jesus. But these truths stand in tension with one another and in our life experiences, powerful, in control, good. I wonder which of those three words are you question the most when you're in an unexpected season and, it's a se and it includes waiting waiting, waiting, and you're not in charge of the timeline. Is there one of these more than the other that is more difficult for you to trust? I wonder. And when it comes to trusting God, problems arise when we're not exactly sure what or who we have been trusting all along. Sometimes we find out, I have trusted in the goodness of God because my kid is not the one who got cancer. I have trusted that God is all powerful and in control because it turns out I trusted that because it wasn't my family who got in the car accident. Or I've believed in the power of God because I have felt such emotional resonance with worship music. And in the ordinary times of life, that's enough. That'll get you through. Good on you. But it's not deep enough, and it's certainly not true enough for the unexpected seasons. When the diagnosis is in my family, the accident touches me and my people. Or when we're feeling wooden and numb, no matter how inspiring the music is, or how funny I happen to be on any given Sunday, which is mostly you laughing at me as I think something's funny. One person says, when something bad in their life was avert, when, when something bad in other people's life is averted, why do so many people say God was go good to them? Does that mean God wasn't good to me? And that question feels powerful because it is. And if you're a spiritual explorer or you're not yet a Christian here, we love that you're here. Uh, this is a safe community for you to explore spirituality in the way of Jesus. That's what we're about here. And you might be like, you can ask these questions in church. 
Yes. We're bringing our real lives to bear to who God really is and jamming them up against each other. That's what faith is, and that's what trust in God is. Because these are questions that every human on the planet who's thinking very much asks at some point. (laughs) Big questions about God. And and maybe what we struggle with most in some of these moments is knowledge. And and maybe where we need to stop. And, And what Joseph had was he came from a jacked up family. We already learned about that. But they passed on to him the knowledge of who God is. In God's character that stuck with him, stuck with his ribs like soul food that stuck with him even here in the jail. Even through an imperfect family, God transmits the knowledge of himself, and that worked for Joseph. And so let's ask for just a few more moments as I speak more to the head than the heart for these moments. Who does God say he is? What does he say he can do? What can I count on and trust? When I'm waiting, waiting, waiting in a place not of my choosing. Well, the first thing God wants us to know about him is his goodness. So we'll talk about this, this tension, this juxtaposition of goodness and power by God. The Puritans called his goodness God's merciful generosity alongside moral excellence. I like that. One evidence of God's goodness, I'm not going to build a whole case for it, it is what's called common grace. Would, would, you, I, would you repeat that phrase after me? Common grace. common grace. It's an important doctrine to have stored away for your unexpected seasons. Common grace is the theology and the teaching in God's word that God showers his goodness. His goodness is shown that he showers it on the righteous and the wicked, everybody, all the time. And that God restrains evil in this world And God can use even those who are morally corrupt to accomplish good things. I'm only going to address the first of those three parts of the definition of common grace or common good from God. It's a deep concept. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 5, 45. God sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Rain sustains creation, which sustains us. And regardless of our status... God continues to bestow provision and beauty on our world. And he's given human beings, it's part of our nature, the capacity to experience and appreciate beauty and goodness. It's a thing that's unique to homo sapiens. Hebrews chapter 1 adds the detail that Jesus sustains all things, all goodness, through his word and his power as the son of God. And that he also made the unit through him, the God had made the universe. And often we think of Jesus as our personal God, our personal Lord or Savior, and he is very personal. But if we think of Jesus only as our personal God, particularly in these times of waiting, when the personal moment of our circumstance is not what we would personally have wanted from our personal Jesus, (laughs) sometimes in those moments, we miss out on the magnitude and the power of God's goodness. Like, mind-blowing, realizing that Jesus, the one who came to serve and to show who God is, what God is like, and what life in synchronicity with God's will looks like in a human being, and then he came to do something about our separation from God, that he holds up the universe by the power of his goodness. It never fails. It never runs out. It continues to provide, sustain, and provide beauty to everyone. Good and evil, the just and the unjust, Jesus said. A way that I will sometimes say it at a wedding when I'm talking about God's goodness is God is so good and God's love, he loves everybody. That even whether or not, and I'll look at people at a wedding, I don't know if I said it at y'all's or not, um, it's a beautiful spot, that flower farm. Um, I'll be like, hey, irrespective of whether you love God and you're worshiping him often or you're flipping him off, doesn't matter. He has showered his goodness on you of how it tastes to lick an ice cream cone and what it feels like to be licked by a puppy. That's common grace. That's a doctrine that you can take to the bank and it can be food for your soul in the seasons of waiting. I took a walk at our men's retreat. We have 
250 Lake Forest Huntersville people on retreat this weekend, teenagers and men, by the way. Um, and I was at the men's retreat, and I took a little bit of a walk Saturday naming the common graces around, the color of the leaves, the feel of the breeze, etc., cetera, et cetera. Common grace that told us God's goodness. But the second thing God wants us to know is to acknowledge God's power. Joshua 4.24 says, The hand of the Lord is powerful. And I'm most in awe of his power. I was thinking about this, of course, this weekend on the men's retreat. God's goodness through common's grace. And then God's power. It it was a clear night up in the, the South Carolina mountains. And I could see the Milky Way and realize... Well, that, that's my zip code. That's the cul-de-sac we live on on planet Earth in this vast billions of miles across universe that God has created, this powerful God. And I'm reminded of the power and the mystery of the God behind it all. And I love him more. I don't know about you. The awesomeness of God's power and the goodness that shows through in his powerful creation, sustain me. And they're enough when I'm not able to interpret personal goodness in my personal moment. They are actually enough for me. But acknowledging God's goodness and acknowledging God's power does raise the question. If God is good, is he really powerful? Because if he was, he wouldn't have allowed this to happen to me. Or if God is powerful, maybe he's not good. Or he wouldn't allow this to happen. And God's very nature, however, includes his complete power and his utter pure goodness. And our minds have a hard time holding these two things together. And it comes up when we're with Joseph in the jail cell that we didn't want to be in. And we have a hard time holding these two things together and not as opposing forces but as both and forces. But for nerdy reasons, this is not a paradox. God's power and God's goodness, it's what is known as a uh, antinomy. And I'm not going to explain the difference between that and a paradox, but an antinomy is defined this way. A contradiction between two apparently equally valid principles. Like, not, they they, they don't appear to be equally valid, but they're really not, and there's something going on behind the scenes. But they are actually both true, and they contradict with one another. That's called an antinomy. This matters, because in your unexpected seasons of of loss or wandering, it forces these questions. If God is so good, then why didn't his power make this better? God's so powerful... He must not be good because I'm not experiencing the goodness the way I define it right now. And applying a big word like antinomy to the dilemma actually brings comfort. To me, again, I'm speaking to God's word is speaking to my head and hopefully to yours. It means that others before us have acknowledged, studied, and put this tension into words that fit my lived experience. There's comfort in saying God's power and God's love seem to directly contradict one another sometimes. But as J.I. Packer states, an antinomy is not a figure of speech only. It's an observed relation between two statements of fact. And we may be sure that they all find their reconciliation in the mind and counsel of God. And if a God who is both all-powerful and all-loving doesn't seem to match your experience in this hard season you're in, or the next one, I gently ask you to consider, who is the God that you trust? And is it possible that the God you trust from all eternity has these two qualities that from a human mind frame contradict one another, but in the divine presence are one and the same? Could it be they coexist in a way that you and I simply fail to grasp, but that God has taught us? To live with trust in God, 
You'll have to accept holding together God's love and God's power without fully reconciling them through your intelligence alone. And you'll have to be okay when some people around you, especially preachers like me, try to make it about one or the other and say there's not really an apparent contradiction. If somebody tells you that, they're, they're trying to solve things that are unsolvable. <laughs> That's not God's word. And in fact, let me finish with two clues, one more clear than the other. That in the person of God, he can be these two seemingly contradicting things at once. The first one is this, every time you flip a light switch, an antinomy happens. Light comes on, and light, physicists have discovered, is not just, is two things at once. There were, there were decades when physicists argued, is light a particle or a wave? I'm not going to get into the details of that because I don't understand it. <laughs> it turns out there, but it, light is both. Sometimes it behaves as a particle, it exists as a particle, sometimes as a wave. One thing, two contradictory states or ways of being. In our universe, that, that is... It's in every scientific fact, uh, textbook as fact. Apparently, something can't be two things at once, except, but light is. That's a fact. And now let me finish. Thank goodness. Oh, thank Jesus. As the worship team comes out, actually, would you stand? C c would you say with me, thank you, God, for Jesus? Can we say that? Thank you, God, for Jesus. God become man. The whole basis of our faith is that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, was two contradictory different things at once. And this God-man Jesus not only was God's goodness and power in one being, on the cross, he gave us all the evidence you and I ever need when we're sitting beside Joseph in the waiting, that God is good and loves you. Because as the God-man, Jesus died on the cross, laying down his life so that you and I could have new life, eternal life as a child of God with our sins forgiven. We need no more evidence that God is good than that in our own story. And that should be ballast for our soul in the seasons of waiting. But three days later, Jesus rose from the dead, showing us the power of God in victory over sin, suffering, death, and evil. Prefiguring that when he comes again, he will make all things new. Wipe every tear from every eye, and death will be no more. Praise Jesus. Oh, Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that because of you, we can trust your goodness and we can trust your power in our seasons of waiting. Help us to be those who love you with our whole heart and those who know you with our whole mind. We love you and now we worship you, the good and powerful God who is enough for us like you were enough for Joseph. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Yeah.
so good to worship together. If you need prayer for any reason, for someone else in your life or for healing or for a delayed dream for anything, members of our prayer team have purple lanyard on. They'll be here at the, the sides of the stage and one in the balcony. They'd love to spend a moment with you. And now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit go with you. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.